Power Athlete Nation, welcome to another episode of the premier podcast in strength and conditioning. Oh, you fuckers, you still did it. I thought in 2021 we were going to get away from it. That was a whisper echo, though. It was? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we got another brew with the crew, so we're going to hammer through our questions from the hotline, and we're going to pick out a few golden winners and see if we can help influence those of you that are tuning into this amazing podcast. So I'm uh, accompanied by my two co-hosts. I got Mr. Tex McQuilkin. Hello. Hey and, there. And Mr. Luke Summers. Nice to talk to you guys. It's a new year. Yeah, new me, new you, mm-hmm. new mm-hmm. us. All, we, all new. I think we're excited. So why don't we start out the year right and get into our first question from our first caller off of the hotline. What's that hotline number? Is it me? 949. No, no, 929-464-4640. Ladies and gentlemen, 929-464-464-0. We can still use the ing in the phone number, right? Can I'm we? not sure. I don't know. I mean, I think we can do anything we want. I missed the memo on the, the ing. We'll have to change the number to, like, what's the, what's the... New me. Is it, <laughs> again, we're we going back to... Th- th- I think if the phone number, new me 21, new is me. available, <laughs> we should jump all over uh, it. I would be okay changing the number. I mean, I feel like we've given, uh, well, I mean, have we really given Ingo B his credit for that? Oh, I don't know. I don't think it was, was it Ingo's idea? No, I was just wondering because, you know, we're saying Ing zero. So uh, uh, maybe I figured he figured he would, you know. I don't know that he's picked good up on it. assumptions. I don't he know that probably, he's picked up on it. I, well, he probably doesn't listen to the podcast. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah that's also true. Because <laughs> if he had, we'd be we'd be ringing it from everywhere. So, mm-hmm. well, we do have a caller that listens to the podcast religiously, allegedly, allegedly. Uh, I don't know. That one seems a little contested. But let's get to, let's get into it. He's been into it for a long time. So this is Block One Coach Connor Lynch out of Arlington, Virginia. Ready, ready. Tex, Luke, Johnny Bud, Connor Lynch here, long-time caller, first-time watcher, looking to pick the brains of the team full of dreams, the squad full of buds, the dudes from the crews, the guys with the laugh machine for answering ing, ing, <laughs> on earth. Anyway, I was about to dive, deep dive into the shallow end of the pool of knowledge where tactical coking was had. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the way, why tax? Is it his IRS ready sense of humor? His intense stare, reminiscent of a taxidermied wolverine, as he works to comprehend the menu at Chipotle. <laughs> Tune in next week to have all the above and more confirmed. Anyway, I was checking out this video on movement solutions in program design. It's up on the old YouTubes. And I couldn't help but notice the first comment was from a shirtless guy who was beside himself with excitement as he complimented Tex on a quote-unquote amazing transformation. This raises many questions. First, Tex, given this most recent one, what's the current total of compliments you've received from dudes who are missing a shirt for life changes you've made? Second, Luke, John, have you ever been called a hero in an online comment? If not, What does it feel like to be sitting in the presence of someone who clearly has been and therefore is? Third, playing off that inspirational hero theme, what's the best training environment you've ever been in? What are the details that heroic coach of that program attended to in their facility setup, the structure of their training, and the culture of their coaching that set it apart? What do you guys see most average gyms overlooking that the great programs are doing? All right. Uh, that's it. Uh, keep up the, uh, let's say, better than okay work. Um, know that we'll all be tuning in next week, just like we do every other week. Uh, <laughs> hopeful that maybe this is the time. time. Callie will be back, and we'll actually uh, get, a, get a good show again. Uh, but uh, I think we'll, think we'll call it there. Uh, Shout out, Handsome Carl, Double D, Fabio for his posts, Don Ricci for his vids on The Collective, uh, MCK looks better with a beard, and Harry Boomshaw. Me love you, Papi Chulo. Call me. Man, there's a lot to unpack there. I think, well, uh, yeah, two minutes and 36 seconds of blabbering. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, I, uh, you know, um, I'd like to start with the first one. Uh, Tex, okay. shirtless hero, Let's complimenting you. Set up the context. In August, we did a virtual conference for TSEC, 
and we did some G. Who's TSAC? Uh, the Tactical Strength and Conditioning. That's huh. brought to you by NSCA. Okay. So NSCA Tactical is the formal. Uh, I believe they rebranded mm-hmm. to. Well, from TSAC yeah, to from T-SAC NSCA to, Tactical. Yeah, yeah. Right. And we set up a pretty jiggy presentation that we were able to capture and we released it onto the YouTube mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Lucas demo. I'm talking about uh, solving a steer training programming problems with some unique setup and execution tools that we use in Third Monkey. And we did it now with barbell training. So you have limited weights where you just got a sandbag. So we presented that, dropped it on YouTube. And that was in August, but just released. So Connor watched it. And apparently there's a comment on there from this guy. I pulled up on the screen. Thanks, Alex K. I don't know where you're from, but I'll, I'll follow you on Instagram now, pal. But that is it. So his he's got a YouTube channel with. What did uh, what was the comment? Oh, I didn't know if you actually amazing transformation, bro. You're a real hero. That was the the comment, huh? Wow, Here it is amazing transformation. You are a hero, bro. And a bunch of pr- uh, now he's missing the comma instead of being like I think this you are a hero, comma, bro, or is it just hero, bro? All like all like kind of all one word. Here's I think the real question because there's. Two people in this video. Does he think that I transformed into you, or that you transformed into me? Well, I think that they're using it made more in like the tra- like the was it like the transcendental state, kind of similar Ooh. to uh, maybe like Stephen Strange and and Doctor Strange, where he can transcend different dimensions to enter new hmm. ones. I, I, I like Luke's take. I think it's more of like the prestige. Like I enter in one door. <laughs> you're, for context, you got to watch the video because we have some star wipes yeah. between like. The barbell and the lecture whiteboard. Yeah, because I and like I think <laughs> at the time we had we had like resources and crew to do like really bitching live productions, and everyone was I knew everyone was going to be sitting in front of their fucking home office on their like in fumbling through their webcam, and I'm like, you know, we put up a three camera system, uh, put our live switcher at the work, and like had a live production assistant, and it was fucking hilarious what, to see was, like the contrast. Of so it. we did two virtual conferences in, in the previous so year. The perver- oh, so that one so was, the yeah, that was teabag. So well, that one is actually, well, so we just started off with the camp gladiator. Uh-huh. We hosted virtual and we're like, mm, yeah, that was cool. But yeah. And then with TSEC, the second opportunity, we're like, let's do it. Right. Let's fucking blow some minds. Yeah. Cause T the camp gladiator was the two webcams, right? We just had two webcams. We, and we yes, had two different like, angles. Yeah. And then we decided yeah, it was it was fun. But needless to say, Prizo is on Power Athlete HQ YouTube mm-hmm. if you want some context. And then you can go ahead and like this bro's comment. And I encourage you to deep dive his YouTube channel. It's entertaining. <laughs> well, I think he's only got like four videos. Well, I think he just started it like a yeah, week ago. 76 but, subscribers. So four videos, I'll, zero shirts. But I'll tell you, he's pretty smart by randomly commenting on different videos because now here we are giving him five minutes of airplane. Mm-hmm. You're right. Now, and that's only because Tex is dodging the question. <laughs> uh, 100%. So, Tex, how many? how many shirtless bros have ever called you a hero? Because I don't, on, on the YouTube comments, I don't think I've ever gotten a, I'm a, you're a hero. Or I don't think I've ever gotten a hero comment well, of a shirtless on bro on YouTube. YouTube commenting is new to me. But shirtless bro, I worked at CrossFit DuPont in Washington, D.C., DuPont Circle. And they called you heroes. You better believe it. <laughs> so Eric, Eric Peterson, please. I've got two points of contention up. with that, John. May I? Yeah, yeah. Number yeah, no, one I'll, is. I'll give you a long leave. New YouTube commenting is new to you? You've never been lost in the wormhole of a YouTube comment thread. Uh, uh, no. We said years ago that the lowest level life form on the planet is the YouTube commenter. And I believe that was like seven or eight years ago we made that statement. Mm-hmm. Because the comments are yeah. probably from the dregs of society. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll get so time you, for that. Okay. So the, the whole the whole concept of comments on YouTube is new to you. Well, I, I don't look at that. I'm j- okay. And then all of the comments, not all of the comments. But what about those girls who were like, That's, we love you so much. <laughs> Yeah, that's the other thing is managing our YouTube channel. Yes. All the comments that I have to remove. The spams. Yeah. The spams hey, that are like, you're cute. We should talk. <laughs> it's like, are those, on, man. Uh, but I mean, they're just bots. Yeah. I mean, I know. It's, it, you know, they're, you're, you're like, not today, Russia. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's, it's just a bunch of like, whenever they talk about these, um, I don't know if you guys saw, but like the Russian hackers went in and did like a huge, huge information grab. 
And like they, at first they were like, no, they didn't get anything. And now more and more stuff's coming out about like how deeply they penetrated within our defenses and all this. And then I see these YouTube comments and I'm like, did they really? Mm-hmm. Or are they just trying to spam us with YouTube yeah. chicks? Who knows? So, John, I guess that leads us to question two. Have we ever been deemed heroes on the Internet by shirtless dudes commenting? Uh, not that I can directly point to. Yeah, like, I, mine are mostly in person. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And all the bars you've been banned out of. Uh-huh, uh-huh. No, I, I'd have to say I don't think so, man. You are uh, a hero. No, I disagree because your friend's move is to take your shirt off to uh-huh. get kicked out of a bar if you want to leave. You're not allowed to leave bars on your own accord. You must be kicked out. Yeah, right. but the word hero is never really worked into that. I mean, it could be now. But here's the thing. I'll tell you why. Because we already have a hero. The yeah. local hero. Dustin Tevis. Dusty Crackers. <laughs> and he's like, he has been called a hero on numerous yeah. occasions. Well, by himself and I'm sure by the general public yeah. and in the newspapers. The people he's saving. Yeah. Local hero. I mean, there's even a song written about him. Jukebox Two Rock Fighters. Man. There goes, <laughs> there goes my. <laughs> As he jumps off the building, uh-huh. like in the aim other for guys. the bushes. Wait, isn't didn't he jump off of a second story into like a bull riding ring, or is that a different pal? That's a different pal. Okay, yeah. Who we'll also him. got kicked out of yeah. the bar. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I shirtless. Mean, mm-hmm. You're really not in the Naperville crew unless you've been kicked out of a bar shirtless. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's on your of, own accord, on, by the way. It's like, I I'm out of here. I'm I, kicking myself out. Yep. By de- derobing. Wow. <laughs> okay. So what then now, what does it feel like to be in the presence? I'm honored. Uh, um, uh, basking. Mm-hmm. I'm just basking in the glow, the warmness. Mm-hmm. 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 2021. I'm the year of the glow. Mm-hmm. I can feel, I can. Like the uh, last dragon. You know, Barry maybe. Gordy's last dragon. Maybe Callie can work in. Or T Money can work in like a little Foo Fighters. There goes my hero right now. There goes my hero. I'm just gonna get up and leave. Uh huh. It's good here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I peaked. I did it. I did it. It took you all these years to peek in. All right. So let you guys want to get serious? Yeah, yeah, let's get let's serious. Do. All right. So what do you guys think about best training environment? For me personally, uh, the best training environments were one where their competition was at a premium. Like when people came in, they were consistent on showing up. They weren't flaking like two minutes before on a Monday, mm. but they were showing shots up fired. early. Shots, yeah, shots fired. fired. So they were showing up early. Everybody had a pretty detailed game plan of what they wanted to accomplish. And people were kind of constantly outgoing and trying to, you know, outpace each other. So if you could do 10, I could do 11. If you could do this, I could do more. So I think there's a, you know, an interesting camaraderie for me personally in the gym environments. And, uh, I saw this in the NFL. I saw it in college when, uh, you know, and especially in college, just because uh, we didn't really have shit. Everybody was pretty poor. Like the only thing we had was like a weight room and maybe five bucks at Steve's Korean barbecue for chicken and rice. So it wasn't it, it, like people didn't really have any other options. So we, we lifted weights and we trained. And when we couldn't train, we went down to the RSF, which was where the students trained. And we go in there and just try to do crazy shit to blow their minds. So I think like if there was a good competition and you had a solid training partner, somebody that was hopefully a little bit stronger than you, and you guys heard us say for years, oh, yeah. if you're the strongest guy in the gym, go find a new gym. Uh, you know, making sure that you have training partners that can handle some heavy loads that are pushing you to do stuff. People that are creative uh, can, you know, reach out and push you to do what you need to do and allow you to try to get to that other uh, point. You know, as I know, um, training by yourself gets real old. So having a good environment when we. Uh, we had a pretty good training environment at Little Balboa and then even at the Balboa gyms were a pretty solid training environment. But mm-hmm. I think the problem and what I always noticed is if the turnover was too high, too quick, it just diluted everything because mm-hmm. then you're coming in and you're trying to get people in. If you can keep like a core group of individuals that had been there for a long time, that's when that camaraderie gets built. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I guess as I'm reflecting, you know, I, I can't remember the dates, John, because like so I rolled in October 2nd. Yep. And then the girls were born on the... Oh, oh, they were born on the 6th. 6th. Mm-hmm. So then there was a bit of a a dip in your attendance. It was. <laughs> like, yeah. but, but then there, I, it was that gym. Like you came back with a fury of a, a thousand sons. And we were like... It was me, you, Sprague, Chelsea, I think was there. Yeah. Or Bonnie for a little bit. Yeah. Benny. And like that. So we were in some interesting programs because it was all very new to me. And there was yeah. like still a lot of coaching going on amongst the crew. And like you said, the competition, camaraderie and showing up and accountability like that. It was just a larger group. Right. And then um, we moved Balboa and it changed a little bit. 
right? And then opened up Power Athlete and then that changed a little bit. But I would say like back then it was just my, that was my first time ever being in an environment like that. So that one's the most memorable for me uh, was that shift. I I was looking at old pictures of when we trained at Little Balboa and uh, there was that one of us doing the blood flow restriction where like we're doing like the chain lunges Mm -hmm. and like the look of death on your face. And Mm -hmm. I like, Mm -hmm. I had my head looking back and I was looking at that picture just laughing, thinking about like. And that was 22 Jack Street size. I don't know if it was during 22, but Mm -hmm. at least this Luke was that. Big yeah, guy. yeah, like 250, two, Dude, 240. That, uh, and, and then we, uh, but the tricky thing about that one, John, was like, man, that was for me personally, like the heat of my travel. That was my 30 to 40 weekend travels and then trying to hit the nine to five Monday through Friday. So, like, those mornings were fucking brutal. Yeah. Versus like the mornings now, you can kind of craft your evenings to prepare for the <laughs> yeah. mornings. You know what I mean? But back uh, then it was like that road warrior schedule, man. Was and a it was also, and then like when we would have a weekend off, it's like, well, I might as well go rage on the peninsula for two days. So then that like talk about self-destruction, man, like, but, um, self-improvement, but, that, mm. but that was like, those, those are priceless times too, in terms of training environment, yeah. right? Like we would just get in, go heavy, go hard. We were all like, Still pretty well put together and shit like that. So yeah, no, I um, yeah, just thinking back, like looking at some of those pictures of like the old Balboa and like the training environments, and when we had the um, when we had the symposium at Little Balboa mm-hmm. with like fifteen people, yeah, yeah, and dude, we were just killing people uh, doing the uh, uh, the lactic acid. Uh, yeah. threshold test on the on the air bikes. Yeah, I had to catch, I had to get some picture. Like there, yeah. I didn't get a chance to do it because there was yeah. a lot of tech stuff. I, I was, I think like the were, Wi-Fi was I, down. I, I think you were puking. <laughs> and and I, I just remember it was, um, uh, God, who, who was our guy on the East Coast? Luke Espy. Espy. Yeah, Luke Espy fucking torched it. And then, you, you know, uh, recently, what was it? Um, uh, somebody, or I, I think it was Rogue did like the, yeah. the, the assault what was it like 50 calories? I don't know the details, but I know yeah, it, it, like. it was like 50 calories or was it was a 50 calories or most calories in like 30 seconds or under a minute. But like somebody did like 39 or they got, no, it, it was in a minute and they got uh, like over 50 or 60 calories. Mm-hmm. So it was like averaging like, like 29 calories of uh, like a calorie a second, which I can't even fucking fathom because mm-hmm. when we would do that, like if you could get like in the twenties right. on that 30 seconds and then any second past 30 would just implode. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about like, uh, um, you know, I mean, obviously we had really good training environments when I trained, when I trained with Raphael just yeah, because, I was get into that. yeah, I mean, we had 10, 12, 15 NFL guys that yeah. were all at different teams, um, you know, playing different positions. We had a couple offensive linemen, all training one really good environment. And, and all that, the guys, that kind of breed, did that breed competition? Uh, it did. Um, I, I think the, um, the interesting thing was. I think Jeff Mitchell, who trained with us, was a little bit older, and he played center for Baltimore for a long time. And uh, Ed Muitala was there, and myself, uh, John McLaughlin, and just a bunch of dudes. And the thing was, is everybody had something they were really good at. Like Johnny Mack was so fucking fast. When we would go run, dude, that dude was like a gazelle. And I just remember like chasing him on everything. And then one day he wasn't there, and we were running, and I was sprinting against Roth. And I remember uh, all of a sudden I like caught Roth. And Roth's fast. And like he looked over and got nervous and all of a sudden fucking like turned on the afterburner <laughs> and barely beat me. And he was like, didn't want to run. And that, that day he's like, I'm good. I'm not, I'm not going to run anymore because he was so scared I was going to beat him. <laughs> the but, Nas. Uh, but man, uh, we had so many like the, I think the, the thing which is really like as I think back universal is uh, a very, very simple game plan that can be executed uh, at a high level of intensity based upon proficiency. Like, I think like if you get into something and you're unsure about the movement or what, you know, I don't have this and I got a sub in here, like it adds like just an element of like a little bit of like taking your foot off the accelerator, showing up being like, hey, we're going to hit these moves. This is what the intensity is. This is what other people are going to do. And then putting yourself in that training environment and then just giving over to it and allowing it to be, you know, experiential more so than, you know, constantly analyzing and looking at this. And the thing that I really like about following a program opposed from like, what am, and, and even following other people's programs, not just mine. And I think back in the day when we were following a lot of those, uh, you know, really testing a lot of what you guys see on these different programs from 22 Jack Street and the anabolic cycles and the metabolic conditioning, um, you know, all the stupid Bulgarian f- CrossFit football stuff, which I, I look back on and I'm like, God, I can't believe we did this. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. 
Um, I think the one thing that was universal was that the plan was fairly simple. It was, uh, it was consistent and there was a level of intensity that needed to be reached for survival for you to get through this on the other side. Like you had to have fucking to quote Dave Brewer, all your shit in one sock, <laughs> which I always laugh at. I'm like, who shits in a sock? Mm. Mm. Um, well, to build- is that a question? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. The, the, Connor asked that call in, but call back yeah. and ask that the, to build off that, the, I've been in a lot of weight rooms, a lot of different coaches, coached under a lot of different coaches. So I had many different cultures that right. I had to step into and then dictate. Mm-hmm. The at, at Georgetown, for example, it was all about the the spreadsheet, the car, the program, mm-hmm. the magic program that then it was all about this. And you had to put the athletes and you had to follow it to a T. So it's this magic thing that was the culture was on a piece of paper. And I did my best, but didn't back and believe in that. And then I got thrust into the University of Texas. And we talked about the magic of Oz, pulling back the curtain, seeing that. And that was very coach based Mm -hmm. and Benny freaking lightning in a bottle, uh, Wiley, he would jump into the training and be that energy and try to elevate the kids to match him on the program, which we're leading three sessions a day. But that feels really, really, um, this word superficial. Like, I mean, I mean, that's what I'm getting at is that artificial. it It was so reliant on the coach versus leading the team, which then leads me to the the Ruiz in which if he needed to step in and do some crazy uh, deep lunge into a step up with 275 pounds in combat boots and jeans, he was able to. And then at the same time, he was relying on all of us as individuals. How my experience was there, we had two morning sessions, one you participated in as an athlete to get a feel and experience and two you coached. Sometimes you coached first and then jumped mm-hmm. in second. But either way, the whole class that he set up, you're, you have a training partner and you're coaching each other up. And then it's relying on the supervision of the, the head coach to then make sure the execution is there and the intensity. And if the intensity is not matched, any demo that Ruiz presented or put upon the the coach, whether it's me or or any of the other coaches, was it's going to be at the intensity, the expectation that you want from your people. So if it's crossover step to sprint, you are mother effing crossover and step to sprint to win. Mm-hmm. So that way the people would mimic your intensity, even if their movement wasn't perfect. The intensity in the I, I don't I refuse to use the word effort, but the intent that they put into their movement was there, whether they were a 40 year old athlete ex MLS guy that was showing up or one of these college swimmers that was still in the prime of their athletic competition career, it was there. So mm-hmm. that was a little bit different. And then I loved the, every three weeks we had to rearrange the weight room sure. to then athlete to just, you perked up a little bit as an athlete, not knowing what to expect. But then me as the coach that had move all the shit mm-hmm. mm, a little bit different, but at the <laughs> same time, all these different where one culture relied on this magic, beautiful mastermind program. Come on. And then the, the Benny's expectation, I have no idea if he's still doing it, but Oklahoma's winning. And then the, the Ruiz is still, still doing it. So it's different cultures, expectations, but the, uh, I mean, it's, it's, arranging the program. I do agree there in the same time, but then holding the athletes to an intent. And if they're not matching that, what do you then step in as a coach to do to get them to equal your expectation of execution that you had in mind with said program? You know, the, uh, the really good programs that we trained at, um, and I can think back of the good ones and the bad ones, uh, the ones that were too much coach emphasis, like too much coach effort, like the Benny Wiley's and, you know, where the coach is trying to like, you know, get everybody hyped. were kind of very lackluster. The ones where it was kind of player led and there was like a very interesting nucleus of individuals that were expecting more. Like, you know, when you think about like veterans versus, you know, young guys, uh, I think that veteran leadership becomes really important, especially when you see like dudes doing crazy stuff. I remember uh, one of the things that I remember most about Raphael, and he's been saying this for, geez, probably since he was born was that a bullet doesn't choose how fast it comes out of the gun. As soon as the hammer strikes, the bullet comes out with max acceleration. Like it doesn't get to go half speed. And he'd always talk about like be the bullet in the gun. And um, that mentality of like doing everything explosive and doing it fast, uh, I think 
you know, permeates, especially a lot in like athletic training systems. And, you know, if you're doing like a field strong or, um, you know, a hammer or something that's going to put more side on that with, uh, with the athletic style of training opposed from something maybe like Jack street where now you got to kind of slow down the movement a little bit and focus on eccentrics and, you know, quality of movement. Um, you know, cause, uh, you know, the goals are slightly different. I mean, in Jack yeah. street, we're looking to create the biggest, strongest athlete we can, you know, there's a reason that bodybuilders are much bigger than power lifters, even though they're not as strong. So I think that there's has to be an interesting trade off of strength work, but also some hypertrophy. So I think there's always gotta be this constant emphasis and almost rebalancing, almost like a, a stock portfolio, let's say, you know, your financial guy gets out there and, you know, he talks about like, Hey, you know, stocks are up, bonds are down, bonds are up. And they kind of constantly are looking at this. And I, and I know, this is when I was looking at like different models on how um, like Harvard and these uh, institutions grow this institutional wealth. What they do is they have these really simple game plans and they just adhere to the game plan and look and be like, hey, we're going to get consistent growth and we're going to do this rebalancing. And I remember that was a pretty good indication for really training programs where you look and say, all right, um, you know, what's the like, what am I trying to accomplish? What's the rate of return I'm looking for? How is the program balanced? Am I doing it when all of a sudden you see strength come up too much? Uh, you know, how does speed get affected? If muscle mass and people are getting bigger, how's the strength kind of balance? And so you're in this constant rebalancing of uh, the program. And I think what's really nice, especially on the tra- power athlete training programs, is there is no one size fits all solution. I mean, we figured that out years ago. People are training for different outcomes, different goals. And so they need a slightly different variation, different emphasis for that power athlete program. And uh, that rebalancing happens. And I think what's even more amazing is people following Power Athlete have figured out how to periodize and rebalance the programming themselves. Like, hey, I'm going to do this for three or four months and then I'm going to do this for a couple months. And they almost use this like block periodization of different programs to kind of meet their goals, which to me is something we we never really expected, but it just kind of happened. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, whenever I see it happen, like I just was answering questions earlier this morning. A guy who's like, oh, you know, I just spent, uh, you know, three months on Jack Street and I'm coming over to Hammer because I need to work on my sprint stuff. And, um, you know, for, you know, to max out is, uh, you know, uh, ACFT. And he's like, dude, I, you know, I'm the only thing that's prevented me from maxing out is I got to run 30 seconds faster on my runs. So now I want to focus on my runs, but everything else was maxed out. So I always think it's pretty amazing that people find a way to, you know, whether it's rebalancing or, you know, adjusting the EQ, like the one that Dave Tate gave. Um, I went to a talk that Dave Tate gave where he talked a lot about training like a, like an EQ on a stereo where like you play with the gain and the bass and the, the, you know, the treble and you start playing with all the knobs until the sound and sounds perfect. Um, but everybody's a different ear. So then the song to, changes. And then, yeah. Right. And, yeah. and then it drops. Mm-hmm. So, the beat drops. Uh, I think the one thing that's universal <clears throat> is, um, and I hate the word, no, I mean, I love the word intensity, <clears throat> but I hate how it's used so often in many different ways. But I think when I think about intensity, I think about like focus, having a game plan, everybody showing up, everybody knowing what we're doing, everybody on the same page, and then everybody moving as... Uh, you know, directly as violently, you know, as well as they can in one simple direction. And I think the programs that I've seen that have failed were the ones that one were too complex or offered too much variety too early. We discussed this this morning. I think there's a desire by coaches, especially at gyms, that there has to be this idea of constantly buried that you have to throw new movements at people all the time to keep them interested. And I think while I kind of understand that from like a marketing and maybe client retention problem or, um, uh, like situation, the basics are the basics because they're always been the basics. They're the simplest things because they get the greatest return. And so teaching people how to do the basic, you know, primal movement patterns, X, Y, and Z axis, mm-hmm. step squat, lunge, uh, you know, vertical push, vertical press, vertical or horizontal press, horizontal pull. I mean, all these basically different planes of motion, you know, being able to jump and plyometrics and sprint. Like I told the guy yesterday, um, you know, the only thing I've never seen anybody do poorly is sprint uphill poorly like i've never seen anybody run uphill bad like everybody can run uphill pretty well now the degree and when intensity in which you run up is going to be different uh is going to be the differentiator but everybody runs uphill pretty well so if you could find a 30 to 50 yard grassy hill with a slight incline and run up it that's a fairly decent you know sub for some for conditioning stuff so i think having a plan uh having a, a group of like-minded individuals that understand the intended outcome and are all moving in that direction and then having a just a, a very fun environment a welcoming environment where everybody shows up and whether or not you like the person or not you're stoked that they're there because they're going to push you harder on that note john i think i look back to 
so probably like OPT as well has talked about it in his is when you're well I'm, and I'm coming from gen pop malt like you know let's say 150 clients total at the gym let's say 70 are showing up a week of those 70 uh 50 percent are showing up three days you know 25 are showing up four days and then another 25 are showing up two days right and like all sorts of mix mash and what you forget as a coach i think going into like the culture intention uh entertainment experience and all the things that like make training enjoyable is there's a person in that class who like it's the only training session they're getting that week now as a coach you may have another 25 sessions to coach and you're going to like, you just get complacent. You get tired. You're like, you for, it's not important to you, but you don't appreciate the importance to the, the individual is going to be showing up that one time a week. Right. And that could be, I, I don't know if that is a burnout issue. I don't know if it's just, um, you, you don't, you don't have that vision or appreciation for it. But I just look back into like the later portion of my coaching career at Balboa and like falling into that trap. Well, Not necessarily every day, but like you just have those days, you know, and you just fucking forget. I think part of the problem, and this is why um, the guys that were teaching the seminars for the CrossFit Level 1 for CrossFit ended up uh, not working for like during the week at their gyms right. or selling their gyms all, all around and just traveling on the weekend. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to, to strike magic during the week and then get on a plane, fly somewhere, show up and try to fucking wreck shop oh, yeah, on, yeah. On, on some people on the weekends. And I, I really, as I look back on that, I'm like, man, that was probably for you guys. And I know it was for me, uh, the like greatest source of burnout where you like you come in and especially when we'd work on the weekends where we'd show up at this yeah, gym, you save know? the good juju for the, for the weekends. Yeah. Right. And then you burn that juju up. And, but, uh, but those guys were legitimately excited to be at a CrossFit football seminar. They right. were excited to be there. Well, most of them, we hope. Yeah. Uh, and you like pour all this, you know, uh, time, effort, intensity, panache. you know, pan- panache, uh, a banana, uh, <laughs> into these guys. And then we'd show up Monday and it'd be like, and it would just kind of Eeyore in. And I remember Mm -hmm. thinking like you, it's really hard to be up seven days a week. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and and I remember that was pretty universal. I remember like Chuck Carswell. And when I went to dinner with a bunch of the level one guys for that event I did at the NFL, uh, not one of them, well, they, they had all, uh, everybody had sold the gym. If they hadn't sold the gym, they weren't coaching during the week. They had people coaching for them. They were just doing some management stuff, right. but they were saving all their energy for the weekend. So I think it's just really hard to, to, you know, pour all that time. And I think the issue, and you, you alluded to it perfectly where people show up and this is their one hour, this is their moment. This yeah. is their one hour out of the 24 and they want to be inspired. They want to do this. And you've been doing this since like 7 AM. Yeah. Right. Right. And, uh, that's why, uh, it's not an easy job. Yeah. So I guess, you know, with that said, maybe it's recognizing burnout, having resources, like investing in the resources and talent and coaches to maintain the expectation, the the culture, the environment for when, if you're running a gym as an owner operator or you're even you're, you know, you're in a team training space uh, as a strength coach, let's say D3, D2, and you work in 50 fucking sports, like you need a staff to like, to help you spread the load. Right. And I don't know if that's a, what, what Connor's looking for out of this question and maybe some insight that we can share on that final point, which he, he was asking like, what are other gyms doing that, you know, you've seen in that culture that we've, we have thrived in and seen as a culture athletes thrive in. Well, uh, to add on that, I mean, to, to help from my perspective of what most average gyms are overlooking is the common vernacular within their 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 movement and their coaching so you got four coaches so to build off what john presented within the power athlete programs we know when i move from a bedrock into a jack street or into a field strong or transition from jack street into hammer because i need more running for my career the movements the 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 language that i'm stepping into is consistent is the same. Mm-hmm. So if my staff of four or five coaches are using dead bugs or using the same movement language, then it's easier for then us to step in. I can assume that this person that I'm coaching has done dead bugs before. It's the the culture within the small gym, the micro gym business where I I have a coach that, okay, you coach at this gym in the mornings and then you come to me in the afternoons that is going to be a problem. You need to have, make sure that all coaches are speaking the same language of movement. And then that's going to make burnout 
less likely because one, you're investing in their education. Mm -hmm. So you are investing in them as individuals. So you're going to keep their energy and morale up. And Connor, if you want to do more teaching, that's where you enjoy speaking and that's going to increase your or decrease your burnout. So getting this common language of movement throughout will be more beneficial to your clients. And that's what I imagine a lot of these successful gyms are doing. It's just whatever language that they want to instill. Mm -hmm. We've found that successful. It's just what we do. And I feel a lot of other gyms are overlooking that because they're still in the mercenary coach model where they're just picking up people to pick up one, well, two, three, four classes. Well, what makes a good good, good gym? I think that's an even an intri- uh, more interesting point. Like as we've kind of looked at this stuff, I mean, the there's really kind of two models, right? You're obviously in the global gym model where you sign up a bunch of people and you hope to God they never show up, right? <laughs> uh, you know, which is kind of like the Gold's Gym kind of 24-hour fitness type mm-hmm. of model. But then you have like uh, more of the micro gym model. And I think the issue becomes like uh, if you can maintain your basic clientele, like, uh, like the Colonel, like that, you know, and, and I, I still laugh at, uh, thinking about Bo, Balboa that my brothers and their crew of old dudes still show up and train every morning at like 6am. And those guys have been doing it for, you know, a number of years. And I think like those individuals that, uh, have been there for years and there's a certain culture, I think that really helps. And I think too much turnover, not only within the staff, um, you know, the clientele, I think just hurts you. But I also think people get burned out. So you got to turn people over or find a way to spread them out in such a way. But then it's like, well, I want to make money. I want to coach as many classes, but I think that doesn't help the environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we get it? I think we got it. Are we missing anything? Well, John does have an article from way back. It's called vision and culture on talk to me, Johnny, Mm -hmm. which I will link up in the show notes. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I actually, um, got up on Sunday morning and wrote one that's, uh, Oh, you got a new blog. uh, I I got one. Ah. I sent it over to, uh, a link in both. I sent it over to our editor for him to go through a little bit and make some, some thoughts on, but it's really, uh, uh, seven rules or seven tips for success in 2021 based Mm -hmm. off of things that I observed in 2020. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. vision and culture happens to be in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, perfect timing, Connor. Mm -hmm. Well, there you have. All All right. right. And I think we did, we did it. Mm -hmm. That's 929-464-4640. Leave us another message on the hotline because the hotline is always hot and we're always excited to answer your questions. And if you want to know more about training, Come check us out at powerathletehq.com and you can check us on social at, at powerathletehq and pretty much anywhere that the internet extends. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. for educational resource, check our YouTube, which eventually leads you down a rabbit hole mm-hmm. towards the, the academy. academy. Right, right. Awesome. And the amount of shirtless hero comments that are bound to hit these videos. I'm kind of actually a little nervous that now we're just going to get nothing but shirtless hero comments. Oh, this guy's a shirtless hero. I mean, we only have like 5,000 videos that, so whoever wants to shirtless comment them, done. Shirtless hero comment. Now it's time for you to empower your performance. Head to powerathletehq.com backslash training to choose from a number of programs to meet your specific performance goals. And if you like to break a mental sweat too, visit academy.powerathletehq.com and become a real stakeholder in you or your athlete's success. Until next time, bye!